Up to now, every single outbreak was uh, fairly contained in time and place and was brought under control after a few months. And uh, usually there were like 40, 50 deaths, sometimes up to 300, but that's it. And uh, cumulatively, we've only had 1,500 deaths uh, from Ebola, which means uh, 40 a year in, in 38 years. So you can't say it was a public health problem. But now suddenly, uh, we are uh, confronted with not just an epidemic, but with a humanitarian crisis. And in West Africa, where never before uh, there had been a, a known Ebola outbreak. It is a combination of, the one hand, uh, countries that are coming out of decades of civil war or corrupt dictatorship, meaning that everybody was on one side or the other. There's no trust in government, no trust in messages. And that, uh, as one of the implications, was that people wouldn't even believe that there is an epidemic or that there is a virus involved. Secondly, um, the health system, the health services, um, were uh, co you know, collapsed uh, because of the civil war. And most professionals in at least Sierra Leone and Liberia had left the country. Liberia was left with uh, 51 physicians in 2010. Some of them worked in the Ministry of Health, so they're not that useful for direct clinical care, meaning we have one physician per uh, 100,000 population. So the, the whole system uh, is being rebuilt, but um, not yet to the point that it could confront an epidemic. And thirdly, there are um, strong beliefs in disease causation, um, where there is not much space for um, infectious agents but it's about um, witchcraft, about, uh, you know, um, with factors that are out of control of individuals or under supposedly the control of individuals who want to do harm to someone else. And finally, I would say um, the fundamental reason we have this uh, massive epidemic is the lack of response initially, the denial. It took, of course, three months to diagnose that this was Ebola. Um, and that I can understand because you can only find what you're looking for and nobody expected Ebola in West Africa. But having put that aside, it took another five months, a thousand deaths, and then two Americans who were uh, repatriated before this was called a uh, public health emergency. And there is no excuse for that. And that was a result of denial and, uh, you know, and not facing the reality by the governments, but also by the international community. We had the 10-year war in which, um, you know, people, the large minority of, majority of people really suffered, but they also saw a small minority prosper, if you like, and that happens in every war, you know, whether it's the contractors who get the opportunities to rebuild the nation um, or indeed um, NGOs who come in to help after the war. But what people see is that other people are prospering while they are suffering. And when that happens repeatedly, as it has now for Ebola, people just get a sense that when something goes wrong, it's something that is kind of possibly a conspiracy um, from the minority that benefits from it. So for example, um, when Ebola um, first broke out in Sierra Leone, um, a number of people, including highly educated people, um, because of my role in public health, Started, I started saying to them straight away, you know, you really must be careful, you must do this, you must do that. And they said to me, oh no, it's, it's nothing, it's just the government, um, you know, raising a scare so that um, they can get donors to put resources into the country. Due to the fact that for over several years, the, during the civil war in Sierra Leone, which lasted from 1991 until 2002, the health system uh, had collapsed and there was a lot of um, damage caused uh, to the government services during that time. We find that people don't necessarily look for the health care uh, to be provided by the government they tend to make their own arrangements to um, get health. Even though in the recent past, the government has been 
uh, had a number of initiatives to particularly address the issue of maternal and child health and the free health policy. In reality, because of problems with the system and the provisioning and perhaps corruption and inefficiency, people don't look, I think in many cases, to the national um, health provision for their health care. And so when Ebola came, people felt that this is something that they would deal with in the way at home, the way they usually tend to deal with their illnesses. And they looked to call on the nurses to come and treat them at home. And um, I think therein perhaps some of the problem lay. And because there's a huge shortage of doctors, a very limited number of young doctors working in the national, in the government health service, perhaps who didn't have knowledge or ex experience of something like Ebola, there wasn't even for those people who did heed the call to go to the health, nearest health center, they went there and found that the services were not available. If you think about it, here's a health system that is quite weak. So we have like two doctors in Sierra Leone for every 100,000. The health systems have been weak for a long time and people have learned not to trust those health systems, not necessarily for any other reason than the fact that they have poor health outcomes. So people start to think of hospitals as a place where you go to die. Um, and if they don't trust that health system, then they don't want to go there. And now, if you have this, and you know that there is talk of a deadly virus, do you then go to that hospital? No, you're, you're not sure, especially if you're unsure that it may be malaria, in which case you think, well, what if I go there and then I get infected? So these are the true fears that people have. Um, Liberia recently got out of the Civil War, and so there's not a lot of trust amongst the people in Liberia. When you say one thing, they don't believe you. And so when the outbreak happened, I remember I was telling my staff and they said that they didn't believe that there was a thing called Ebola and let alone that it was in Liberia. I don't know if it's because of the war. I don't know if it's because of the government or what, but it's just, I think it's just our nature not to believe something that we hear first off. We have to see it for ourselves. And I, I know that, it, that it's that way because I do the same thing as well. If you tell me that it's raining fireballs outside, I'm not going to believe you. I will go outside and I will see that it's raining fireballs, but I still won't believe you. The only way I'll believe you is if a fireball hits me on my hand and I'll say, okay, it's really raining fireballs. And that's how Liberians are. We don't just take things right. So we have to see someone catch the disease and die from it before we believe, okay, there's Ebola and it's in our country. So I don't know where that comes from or how that came about, but that's just how it is. I had a, like a staff meeting, like there's, there's a disease called Ebola and it is, it has spread. I said first it started in Guinea, then it went to Sierra Leone and now it's here in Liberia. And I was informing them on, you know, what usually happens when you catch the disease, like if you are, you know, excess vomiting. I was telling them the symptoms and they laughed at me. They all laughed at me. They said, boss lady, there's no such thing. <laughs> they just want us to, you know, to be queen people. And what we mean by queen is to be Western because they were saying stop eating bush meat and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And so they took it as, oh, they just want us to be queen. They don't want us to, you know, live the life that we're used to living. They just want us to be like them. There's no such thing. And so, and they laughed and as the cases grew, they were like, okay, maybe it is around, but it's not gonna affect us. And then right before I left, it was within my zone. And then they were like, boss lady, there's Ebola. And I'm like, I was telling you guys. You know, so it, it took a, a long time for them before they were convinced. There is still a lot of suspicion and uh, about the conspiracy, but I think some of the conspiracy has now moved to um, making allegations that uh, Ebola came from a Western conspiracy, 
that somebody spilled something in the lab, that uh, it was uh, deliberately introduced by Western researchers. No, not, not anymore that it came, somehow came from the government of Sierra Leone. A lot of Liberians believe that the reason why Ebola has affected Liberia very harshly is because of the actions that we have, you know, the things that we've done, like this is, we're paying for our sins by having this. So people, that, and, and, that's, and that's kind of typical of a lot of West Africans, because I remember when I was in Nigeria, when it hit Nigeria, it was the same thing. They were like, oh, this is because our government is corrupt. That's why we have Ebola, you know? So, it's, so that, that's how they usually perceive it. They perceive it as, okay, we're reaping what we're sowing. We, we're reaping the, the, the effects of, you know, our corruption, our, you know, our bad behavior. There, there were lots of rumors and you know it's not unlike any other situation in which there are kind of conspiracy theories so there were lots um, um, in, including actually a lot of religious and cultural ones so um, a, a belief for instance that it's a curse um, and that maybe Sierra Leoneans have done something wrong but I see that as an opportunity for religious leaders to then sort of use that you know they have enormous influence um, and they also have enormous access to people to use that to say, okay, you know, we understand that these are the beliefs that people have. Well, how can we integrate that with the messaging for prevention of, you know, the, the transmission of the virus?